author, demonologist, wonderful person, dear friend, Samantha Harris. Hello. Just wanted to give a round of applause for this whole event and all the effort that goes into planning to it. So thank you guys for having us and putting on a wonderful event every year. Are you guys enjoying the snow? I think it's like too early, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're gonna talk about some messed up stuff. It's gonna get a little weird, uh, but weird's good, and that's why you guys are here. Um, and I like, I like to make light of things a little bit, just because the stuff that I deal with in these cases gets so dark. And I think it's important to maintain happiness and you know a positive outlook on life. So, um, my name's Samantha. You guys can call me Sam, Sammy, whatever you want to feel like. But um, and at any time, if you guys have questions, you can interrupt me. It's not rude at all. And there's no dumb questions. I might give you a dumb answer, but um, feel free to ask whatever you like. Um, so yeah, so I have a background in abnormal psychology, and then I got out of that because then you realize like everyone's crazy, and you're like, okay. <laughs> so, um, but I finished my BA in communications at Michigan State University. Go green, Tim Marley. Go green. And you know, I did work at U of M, ironically, and I grew up in Ann Arbor. So, um, but anyways, I'm a published author with Llewellyn, and uh, they're one of the biggest metaphysical publishers, which is pretty cool. Um, I do paranormal investigations. I work as a demonologist now with severe hauntings. Um, I've been working on demonic cases for about 10 years now, uh, ever since I was 17 years old. And I first started researching the paranormal when I was about 11 years old. And I think on TV, the only thing at that time was like X-Files, which I was obsessed with, so <laughs> our family was a little odd, so that explains stuff. But created a couple paranormal groups, and the one that I run still is the Michigan Paranormal Research Association. Um, I've assisted screenplay writers, uh, directors, producers for cases. Um, you've probably seen a couple of my cases on television, but um, I've been a paranormal survivor, a uh, haunting. There's another a haunting episode coming out, I think, at the end of this month. They haven't released air dates yet. Um, and then I think we're filming in Toronto again soon, but they've offered me a bazillion TV shows and I've turned them down because one, it'll be like hot girls and bikinis and demons. And I'm like, we're not doing that. Uh, or they've asked me to fabricate evidence like in the sequel to Paranormal State. And I think that would just counter, counteract everything that we try as a community to try to establish credibility and scientific things, you know. Um, okay, well, let's get weird. Um, so demonic hauntings, I have like a new case that we're going to go over, we're going to listen to EVPs, um, I think there's a couple images too in a movie clip from the show. Um, but for demonic hauntings, they're, they're actually really rare. Uh, I deal with it a lot more than most people because of word of mouth referrals and the way that the website's set up. Um, I typically don't deal with, you know, like grandma's spirit in the attic, you know, it's usually where people are being violently attacked um, or people are at the end of their rope and things have gotten really severe for them. Unfortunately, I have to talk a little fast today because we're going to cram it in here, so bear with me. Um, but almost always, I would say 98% of the time in these cases, there's some sort of uh, severe dysfunction going on, whether it's alcoholism, substance abuse, domestic violence, sexual abuse, um, you know, any sort of negative energy or habit in somebody's life kind of creates an opening. And so people always ask, you know, is it the chicken or the egg type thing? I really believe from my research and experiences that these people have these habits and it's kind of like a, a welcoming in for these demonic entities. Um, I didn't grow up believing in these things at all, you know. Um, I think I stopped going to church when I was like 11, but they never preached anything about, you know, demons and darkness and blah. Um, but I had psychic experiences since I was little and I had death premonitions, things like that that I didn't really make a lot of sense out of. Um, and I didn't deal with demonic stuff until I was about 17. I was dating a guy that had a demon attached to him. Which means I have really good taste in men, as usual. So <laughs> my poor beloved boyfriend over here is like, don't look at me. So <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, but demons feed off of negative energy. And that's why they're drawn to people who have issues and dysfunction in their life. They feed off of that. And oftentimes, in a lot of cases, you're going to see where they instigate fights. They can actually aport objects. You know, So say two little sisters are fighting over a shirt. They're like, well, you stole my shirt and you moved it. And I didn't, you know, yada, yada, and they'll actually create situations where people are fighting with each other. Um, you'll see relationships decline, and uh, basically demonic hauntings, it affects every facet of their life, so their finances. You'll see foreclosures, bankruptcy, uh, divorce, or fighting in relationships. Their health goes down the drain. Um, the family dog gets sick and dies mysteriously. There's miscarriages. I mean, it's, it's literally any way that they can destroy your life or break you down, that's what they do. So very, very lovely critters. Um, but anyway, so they really don't have a good uh, motive. These are some of the characteristics, and I'll probably just skip over a bunch of them because I want to get to the cases because we're short on time. 
Um, oftentimes you'll smell really horrific smells. Now, human spirits are capable of creating smells, you know, cigar smoke or grandma's perfume smell. Uh, but with demonic smells, there's usually like putrid, horrific smells that honestly can knock you to your knees. You might smell sulfur, rotting, death, you know, uh, sometimes a burning smell happens often. Um, so it, it just depends. And visually, frequently they don't show themselves. And oftentimes demons don't even make themselves known. So when you actually have a demonic haunting, it's pretty rare. Um, oftentimes they work behind the scenes because, you know, the devil unknown is, is a lot scarier and worse than something you know about. So they like to manipulate situations behind the scenes and oftentimes won't even manifest for people. But some people will see hooded figures, things like that. Um, when I've seen these delightful beings <laughs> uh, before a house blessing, they'll, they'll sometimes visit me to try to scare me off. I think it's like an intimidation tactic, being like, hey, look what I can do, or she want to mess with this. Um, but I've seen something, I know it sounds really crazy, and I did pass a psychological evaluation of DSM-4 back in the day, so <laughs> don't have mental illness here. Um, but like seven, eight feet tall, lanky, black shadow thing that shot across the kitchen into the um, living room. Um, and instantly, it's just a horrible feeling. I can't begin to describe what it's like to be in the presence of evil. Um, I don't wish it upon my worst enemies. It's just that horrific. It's like a black hole and sucks everything out of your, your life and energy and you feel like you're gonna die. Um, so that's the kind of pieces we get to deal with and it's kind of like being a firefighter or a soldier. You know, you have to run into the burning building where everyone else is leaving, you know, and um, so you kind of have to have that courage and that, that strength and um, a good mindset. And oftentimes I try to harness um, like a mama bear energy. I get mad for my clients because Oftentimes, little kids are being bothered and harassed, and, and oftentimes these families aren't even sleeping in their own beds anymore. They're all sleeping together in the living room. They're having super supervised showers because they're so afraid to be alone. And like, if you can just put yourself in their shoes for a second, just think about you come home from work. You know, most people hate their job, right? <laughs> you come home and you're looking for like a safe refuge, but then you're like in your own mental prison and like a, a hell basically, and it's a horrible life. And oftentimes these cases are going on for like 10 years or more, um, and they're really at the end of the rope. So I get called in usually when people are like, we've tried everything, we've had house blessings. You know, sometimes um, sometimes the ministers are unsuccessful. Um, so we give it a go and, and try to do our best. Um, so blah, 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 we'll skip over that. Um, let's see, so I just had a case earlier this month, it was in Alpena, Michigan. And I had taken about a year and a half off because this kind of work really takes a toll on your life. Like I can't, I can't even begin to explain how many bad, unfortunate events and stuff I've had in my life that could be coincidence, but when you start to see these patterns in these people's cases and lives, you know, you start to put together the puzzle pieces, and you're like, oh, because I'm doing this, you know? Um, but I still, I still want to do that. I still want to help because it's spiritually rewarding. So we had a case, and Megan basically is a, a woman. She's a mother of a little four-year-old boy. Um, she had a husband that was in the service who passed away, was hit by a drunk driver. Um, anyway, she started spending a lot of time at the cemetery. And I'm not saying if you go to a cemetery, you're going to pick up some demon or whatever. It's not true. But um, she's starting to feel this presence. And she thought it was her husband, Josh. And she's like, Josh, is that you? You know, at a cemetery site. And uh, she, then she felt the tugging on her leg. And then she realized, like, this was not Josh. And she started egging it on. And she's like, I said stupid things to it that I shouldn't have said. She's like, oh, are you going to come home with me now? Or are you going to follow me? And kind of egged it on. And so I always tell people, don't instigate these things. Don't aggravate them. Don't even pay attention to them. You know, tell it to leave kind of thing. But anyway, so she found um, herself with an attachment. And she uh, started uh, self-mutilating, cutting herself, pills, drinking. Um, a lot of domestic problems going on too. And her current boyfriend's an alcoholic with a lot of other issues too. So anyways, I had been kind of given prior knowledge that she might be borderline possessed. And I prayed about this one, and I was like, I don't know if we should be dealing with this, and we're gonna come into a house blessing and give it our best attempt. Um, we actually had to resort to an exorcism. Um, and a lot of people believe that exorcisms can only be performed by like, you know, something that's approved by the bishop or the archdiocese, things like that. We actually proved that that was wrong and we were actually very successful. Um, the only problem that we've had since then is that her husband's drinking habit's still there and now it's affecting him. So he just started counseling two Fridays ago and we're really hoping to move forward with the, uh, the blessing, possibly doing an exorcism for as well as two. Um, but yeah, these things are very much real, but it wasn't like in the movies. There was no split pea soup spraying around like head spinning and like crazy stuff like that. Um, and it was almost like a pathetic thing, like this entity that you could sense from her was it was just like sad in a way. It was like a, a pathetic existence type thing. It was really interesting. But um, so yeah, so I got an EVP from that that you guys will hear in just a second. Um, and oftentimes when we do blessings, I have two prerequisites now. 
We've had a 98% success rate with house blessings, the removal of demonic hauntings. Out of the cases that didn't work, one, it was like an alcoholic who didn't want to give up drinking, or whatever it was that drew the entity in. And the other time is when not everyone is present. So I require everyone in the family to be there and be 100% on board, otherwise it gives the entity a reason to hang on, like a legal right. Demons supposedly have legal rights, which sounds like attorneys. <laughs> so like, maybe that's where they're from, I don't know, legal <laughs> stuff, but uh, that was ironic. Um, so anyway, so you are gonna see or hear her little son in the audio recording, he was completely safe. We bought him a toy car truck thing to play with the whole time, he was distracted. And, it was fine, but at one point he did cry. Um, it was nervous and stuff like that too. But other than that, he was very empowered through the whole ceremony. He helped out with the holy water. And children are very, very protected. And as, as long as you work together as a family unit, as a team, it's a very effective thing. So um, so I think the first one we're gonna listen to is the actual EVP. Um, you're gonna hear it in between the remote control car going on in the background. This recorder was in a separate room, but you're gonna hear kind of a mechanical voice and demonic EVPs are different than human spirit EVPs. Either they're extremely clear, or they kind of have like this mechanical sound to them, but you can pick them up easily. They have a different signature too on a spectrogram. Um, so it's kind of unique, and in, in when we capture demonic EVPs, there's actually physical evidence when we analyze the file that shows it's not you know, similar to a human spirit, something separate. So, um, so this one, you're gonna hear me talking to Megan, being like, hey, you're gonna feel a different energy, you're gonna feel a difference, you know. Um, once we've finished performing the house blessing, and you're going to hear it say lies in the background. And I play it like three times, each one slows down. So you should be able to hear it. If not, I'll click it again if the audio is not matched up. But wasn't an awesome EVP. The next case you're going to hear, you're going to hear clear as day, and it's the sleaziest voice I've ever heard. Um, but real quick, this is just some quick audio from the, uh, the actual exorcism ceremony. What was really interesting, I mean, I know the rites of exorcism, the Catholic uh, version of it, um, and as I was doing it, we weren't getting any adverse reactions, but we, honestly, when I set the book down and I started speaking truths that I know about God and the divine, you know, what like Jesus love, you know, angels, stuff like that, she started vomiting, and it was interesting because it's about intentions. It's about speaking from the heart. It's like, you know, Megan, you were loved. You were a child of God, blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't effective. When I was distracted trying to read these verses and get through the whole ceremony, there wasn't really any sort of reaction going on. But when I actually like stopped and focused and like tried to send love, basically, that's really effective thing. And I don't know, it could be adrenaline, but I literally felt a shot of like energy that jolted through me and it was like a divine energy. And I started praying so rapidly, I didn't even know it was gonna come out of my mouth next, but it just started flowing. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what I'm channeling here, but it was really crazy. And like, you're so pumped up, you know, but it wasn't, I wasn't like afraid. I just felt bad for this woman. So, um, so yeah, so you'll hear a couple of uh, vomiting and then guttural sounds like boom. And like, you the temple of the Lord because once we felt this release you can feel it in the room all of a sudden it's like okay there's something going on the atmosphere has changed um and there's actually science behind house blessings now it does alter the ions in the environment so there's a physical change happening um, but she said it felt like there was an object in her throat and chest and it was like an internal battle going on um you know of course during the time she's having violent thoughts about hurting me her son you know and so it's at that point where you're like i hope i'm not gonna have to like restrain her or anything like that um, but we were able to help her successfully, and this is one of the cases I had a premonition about before she even contacted me. Um, that happens with a lot of my demonic cases. The times where I had a <coughs> demonic case and I didn't have a premonition, it turned out not to be demonic. So I think that radar is kind of pretty accurate nowadays, but I had dreamt that there was a woman 20 to 25 years old. She was 25. Uh, she was brunette, had brown eyes too, which Megan has. Um, and I had her in a headlock, which I would never do to a client, but it'd be my dream. I had her in a headlock with a chokehold, and, commanding out these entities to name themselves. And so the dream was illustrating she was uh, possessed. And in the dream, it further illustrated that by her just kind of like zombie walking into traffic and was almost hit and killed by cars. 
Ironically enough, that matched everything. She also had this reoccurring nightmare of being hit by cars and weird stuff. So sometimes you get these little clues on what's about to happen. Um, and oftentimes I'll be having dreams about battling an entity and the next morning I'll get a phone call or an email for help, stuff like that. So it's kind of like a little, a little heads up or whatever, a little sticky note from the other side. You're like, I got a demon case coming up. So I'm like, oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, probably one of the most messed up cases, I think, because you read about incubi, succubi, but like, do you honestly believe in that? Like demons that rape and assault people? Like how likely is that, you know? And I try to be logical about it, but they didn't tell me that until I got there. <laughs> They're like, yeah, we just think we have a demon in the house, yada, yada. And so we get there, and when it first started out as they thought they had an amorous ghost, like extra friendly, and it would touch them and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, ha, ha, this is funny. You know, it's like an you know, amorous old grandfather or something, and this is weird. Um, anyways, what happened eventually is the husband and wife, for example, had a telepathic connection with it. Demonic entities typically have, typically have prophetic and telepathic abilities that human spirits don't. Um, and he would say something in his head, like perform such and such sex act in his head, and this thing would do it. It would know, it could read his mind. They actually felt different genitals. I know this sounds really crazy, we're getting real weird here, so bear with me. <laughs> You're gonna hear it in a minute talking. Um, but it was interesting, there was never simultaneous attacks. So I don't know if it was two entities or one, but basically they felt these claws, these hands, you know, sexual uh, genital stuff. Um, and the problem was it also started attacking the children. This is a case that I had to bring an exorcist in on. He was unsuccessful on this. I worked with Lorraine Warren on this case as well too. Um, apparently incubi and succubi are some of the worst things to get rid of. And when I had arrived there, I got the sensation that there was some like extramarital affair going on, and that's really what happened. This demon like drove itself as a wedge between the wife and the husband, and it was almost like an affair was going on. He looked forward to these things, um, and eventually uh, Clarissa, I think I named her, um, experienced violent, horrific rapes. Her health went down. That like she had, she was like 39 years old. Her hair turned white, acute heart failure, kidney stones, had to be hospitalized. You know. They would pray before bed, and uh, or she challenged it before church type thing, and then she had a fever like 103 or more, and they had to hospitalize her. You know, weird stuff they couldn't make sense out of. The animals started getting sick. Veterinarians couldn't explain why they're dying. You know, weird stuff like that. But anyways, this is one of the entities, the six to eight foot tall thing that I saw, or seven to eight foot tall, uh, right before I did the house blessing. It was about like two hours before, and I'm like blow drying my hair, and it's not even peripheral. It was like right there. And I see it zoom across um, the kitchen living room and instantly you know what you just saw and it's not natural and it's a horrible feeling. So I was like, well, I still gotta go, you know? And I like, I cussed it out. I got like Jerry Springer on. I was like, get the F out of my house, blah, blah, blah. Like, Cause you have to stand your ground, you know? You can't be afraid of these things cause they feed off that fear. Okay, so the exciting stuff. I'm gonna play um, a clip and it's gonna show you the spectrogram. It's gonna play it and slow it down. You're gonna hear very, very clearly and uh, it's very sleazy. This EVP is also in context to exactly what we were talking about at that time. The husband was like, hey, we had a paranormal group lay down on our master bed and they experienced inappropriate touching. You know, we'd love to see if you experience the same thing. And in my head, I'm like, absolutely not. Like, I don't even want to be touched by this. <laughs> like, why would you do that? Um, so anyways, so he's like, yeah, I want to see if you experience it. Meanwhile, we're gonna hear this EVP and it's like, sweetheart, try this, won't you? And it's like the creepiest used car salesman, you know, like, much just like, ugh, you're gross. Um, and then you'll hear a couple other EVPs will go over, so enjoy this one. To say, in your mind. Mm -hmm. So you have a telepathic kind of thing? Um, the next EVP you're going to hear, I think it says, you got to go. Because it did not like me being there. We have a mutual hatred for each other. So especially when I show up, either demons will hide and they're cowards, which essentially they are. They're just bullies, really. Um, yes, they can hurt people. Yes, they can scare stuff. But really, if you take the mindset of, like, go back to third grade, it was, like, that one kid that bullied everyone. You know, like, you got to play, like, Twisted Sister. Like, we're not going to take it anymore. Like, get pumped up. Uh, and, and just really treat it that way because they just pick on people. Um, so here's the next EVP. This one's pretty clear. The 
Which, we'll see. I, I feel a lot. I mean, I, I feel, I feel, I feel. Yeah, so you guys hear all that too? Um, the next one I'm going to skip over because you guys probably can't hear it or you can come to the table. It's like weird sexual panting and moaning. It's like a grade C, class C, EVP. And what's weird, it's a feminine voice. So I don't know if it was just changing genders or something, or if it was two entities. It's crazy. Um, but you can barely hear it, and I don't want to waste your time. We've got other cool EVPs to get to. Um, okay, Flint case. This is another weird one. This is one of the cases that wasn't successful. The son of his parents was like into dark stuff. This thing would like assault his mom. Like she'd be getting out of the shower and wolf whistle at her, like woo woo. Like hey, good looking. And uh, yeah, <laughs> which is terrifying when you think about it. You got pervert in your house and it's a demon, it's horrible. Um, it would attack her when she was in the shower, things like that. And her son didn't care. He's like, doesn't bother me. And I was like, oh my God, you're such a whatever. I like, want to like lay down the law, like you respect your mother. <laughs> so let me tell you something. But anyway, so if there's a reason why, um, or if there's anybody that doesn't want to have the house blessing done, I cannot guarantee that it's gonna work. And that's why everyone's gonna be on board. And after this case, in the Taylor case, I had the two prerequisites, because with the Taylor case, not everyone was present the entire time, and then came back during lunch break, and then left, and the kids were at school, and they hadn't even shared their dysfunctional stuff yet, too, so it was important to have them there. So this case, you're going to hear some pig grunting, which is pretty common. Um, sometimes I think it results when there's satanic or occult rituals, and they actually use pig bones or they sacrifice animals, which is ridiculous. Um, and so, so that definitely happens. Obviously, there's a political movement of Satanists that are just against, you know, like organized religion and mainstream stuff. But then there's real Satanists. So they're not good people either way. Um, and, and I think it's a problem where people think that sometimes this stuff isn't real. Because I've had Satanists contact me later, like, I thought it was a joke. And it's still following me, and it's real. So and we have to come and clean up that mess. Um, so don't welcome these things in. Um, but anyways, this hooded shadows, claw marks, attack through the shower, stuff like that. She tried to contact me like five or six times in a row. She'd start typing, the computer would shut down. She tried to call, the phone would cut out. But it was like the fifth or sixth time she was typing the keyboard, started typing backwards and weird stuff. Somehow, finally, she got a hold of me, which is great. But they can interfere with technology like that. They'll interfere with my GPS. They'll cause car problems. I've almost died in a car accident surrounding a case. I had a highway post and pale my windshield like three or four inches from my face. I was like, I could have no face right now or be dead. So, but uh, you gotta keep going, right? Um, so anyway, so they talked about the Black Bible stuff and eventually came out about it. First, he was like, I, I don't know why it's here. I have no idea. And you can just sense when people are lying or hiding something, like, yeah, I didn't do something I should have done, you know, or whatever. I was doing something I should have done, but. Uh, they also were renovating, and this is the only case where I've seen demonic haunting stuff related to renovations, but I don't think that was the cause. It's typically only for human spirits. Okay, so in this one you're going to hear pig grunting. At first you're going to hear it knocking, and you're going to hear the... <laughs> So this was all captured in like an attic space, but it wasn't above. It was like literally right next door to their master bed. We could just walk through a door. There was no infestations. There was no, you know, possums or anything like that that could make that logical sound. Um, there's also video footage of this, excuse me, like burping for you guys, sorry. <laughs> um, there's a shadow in this video footage where it just like crosses on by and uh, just other weird evidence that they found. So. Um, that was one of the crazier cases. The Novi Mission case is what a haunting uh, was based off of. This family's haunting thing went on for like 10 years or something. It first started at a farmhouse, and there was a previous owner who was like a real nasty SOB, according to them, quoting them. Um, and he was an alcoholic. Uh, he was suspected of murdering women, possibly, and burying them in the dirt basement. You know, not a good person. Um, and so I think there was something that was attached to him. And then it was like an ancestral inherited haunting to this family. Once they moved in, this thing attached to them. Um, this is a family, one of the families that was sleeping in the living room together. They had to take supervised showers. Uh, Brian, 
well, you're, yeah, Bryn, basically, um, was in the shower, and at one point they actually saw this entity writing. It was like Juan Eid, but it was actually Die Now in the mirror. And the condensation from the, yeah, it was like arts and crafts time. The demon's like, I'm going to write love letters. Um, and so it was inverted. And they actually saw it happening in real time. And they've also seen it where it just appears mysteriously. He also had three days of demonic hallucinations. Demons have the abilities to manipulate your perceptions, things like that. And so they actually thought he had a brain tumor. Because every time people would be talking for these three days, it was horrific, like wails and screams. And then everything that was water, you know, like what we're drinking right here, would look like blood. So they took him. He had a neurologist and a psychological a DSM-4 at that time. No, DSM-5, I think. Um, he had a psychological evaluation. They could not explain it. And they're like, nothing's wrong with him. So it was interesting. I always like when we can correlate science and medical stuff with these cases because we couldn't make sense out of it. Um, disfigured creatures. It had a telepathic connection with brain. It would be like, you're worthless. Kill yourself. Go stab your family. You know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so in, it just would constantly pass through him. So it was like borderline possession. And so this is the case where we get towards the end, and I think you'll see the clip of it. Um, we're getting to the house blessing, and I'm just not feeling it leave yet. And I'm like, I don't know why this isn't. So let's get going with the warfare prayer that we do at the end of it. It's pretty thorough. It kind of reclaims your life, finances, home, body, everything. Um, and we're going, and all of a sudden I look over, and Brand is like sweating. He wants to throw up. He's trembling. He can barely stand. Um, hunched over in pain. And he's like, it felt like an animal, like, fighting inside of my chest. And he's like, I knew if I stopped, like, it would win and I would never be the same. And um, he somehow pushed through it. We, like, helped pray over him um, and, and as a group as well. And uh, after that, it was gone. You could literally feel, like, a light switch. The thing was gone. Um, the family was crying and hugging. And they're like, we got to hug you. We're so happy. And, like, you've saved our life. Um, I don't take any credit. I don't think I'm special in any way like that. I think it's the divine that works through us. And all of you could do it if you want. Don't do it, though. <laughs> um, it's not a fun lifestyle because it ruins your life in a lot of ways. Um, but, yeah, but everyone is capable of this. The divine can work through you. You don't need to be ordained, in my opinion. I know that's very controversial, but, like, we've proven that. It's really about love and intention and the divine working through you, and that's what's so cool. Um, so we have a lot more people nowadays that are helping out and uh, working on doing house blessings and exorcisms, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah, so all these cases I mentioned are in the book, so if you guys want more details, you can come to my table and read this slideshow, or I can tell you more stuff, or read the book, or whatever. Um, so you're going to see a movie clip that, or a little TV show clip from a haunting. Um, so this is like a cat scratch stuff, but Brynn would get like weird burn marks that would just mysteriously, mysteriously appear. Or he'd get scratches that were like instantly infected. Um, so it was definitely borderline possession stuff, and this is a screenshot from what they used on the show um, to demonstrate what they saw in the shower, but here's the video. Uh, an evil entity has invaded the Johnson home. Uh, bent on destroying the eldest child, it has thrown Bryn down the hall. That's the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. He had marks on his body where something had pushed him. It wasn't like a normal scratch. It felt like there was like a dirtiness to it almost, like if you get uninfected, but it, it was fresh. If it can do that, then what else can it do? Refusing to give up, Betty works tirelessly to find help. There had to be someone <coughs> out there that knew what was going on and knew how to deal with it. Brent thought he was going crazy, but then I saw it too. We all did. No, you're not going crazy. But you have to be honest with me. Samantha Harris, an investigator with the Michigan Paranormal Research Association, is willing to help. She just sounded so confident, but at the same time I was thinking, yeah, we well, haven't heard what problems are going on in my house yet. I see on your website that you do a house cleansing. What exactly is that? We remove negative energy and spirits and replenish the house with a white light and positive energy. Samantha seems genuinely caring and concerned. But he's relieved that help is on the way. It sounded like it was a very severe case and I wanted to respond to it as soon as possible. Well, that's the last one. Later that evening, as Samantha is getting ready for the house blessing, she suddenly feels uneasy. It felt like something evil was in my house. I saw in the corner of my eyes some movement. The dark figure she sees matches Betty's description of the entity that is menacing her home. I know what you are! I'm 
terrifying inside, but I knew I had to assert myself and to stand my ground. We're gonna help that family, you hear me? You can't scare us off. In all the years that I had worked on demonic cases, I had never seen one physically appear for us. And it worried me. So yeah, I had thyroid problems during this time. I still do some like extra pudgy. <laughs> so, but I'm like, I'm not talking about demons or so real. Like, so um, but anyway, so yeah, so that was an interesting case as well too. So oftentimes they show up. My animals are so blessed. Like it's some people are like, well, you need to protect yourself more. I'm like, it doesn't work like that. What I think is interesting though is like they can't stay there. It's like inhospitable for them. So they can like show up, do a little you know little event there, and then they have to leave. It's interesting that way. Um, let me see, I'm gonna skip through this. Well, this one's interesting, I'm gonna go to the clip though. This was supposedly a, um, I'll go to that in a second. This was supposedly a poltergeist. Now, I'm still open to the idea of poltergeist, but every case I've been to, they're like, oh, it's a poltergeist. It's turned out to be like a demonic entity, like super sacrilegious reactions, blah, blah, blah. Um, so anyways, this one actually knocked Jan off her feet and smashed her face into a marble hallway, and knocked out all her teeth. Uh, she had to be hospitalized, yeah. Um, and today's the perfect day to make fun of this. Where it originated from, I think, is she went to the hospital to have an operation. Ever since then, it started following her. She felt something follow her. Guess which hospital it was at? University of Michigan. So, I was like, oh, demons coming from you. No, I'm just teasing. They have a great medical system. But um, it was weird because on the way home, her husband like looked at her and just like his eyes were different. It was like, I'm going to drop you off in the middle of nowhere, like F you, blah, blah, blah sweetest guy ever he's like a grandfather figure um and it was just ever since that day was strange um he just never behaved the same and so first it started as little rappings and like weird sounds sometimes our computer would make weird sounds in the computer room so she would hire a technician to come in and take care of it this is a very very wealthy family mind you um actually most cases i deal with people are extremely impoverished because the demonic entity is like dwindled away their finances and you know life's you know sustenance basically um, so this is a gross point, really beautiful house, you know, it's just interesting to see how the paranormal affects different social classes, people all around the world. Um, but anyway, so she started hearing these weird sounds, then she started hearing these like wailing, like shrieks in her heating vent. So, you know, uh, people would come over, take a look at the furnace, nothing's wrong. Then they had water starting to materialize out of thin air, like in the kitchen, they'd be standing there and all of a sudden it'd be like this and pop, like this water would just appear and land on the stool. Then the toilet started gurgling and boiling, not like hot boiling, but just weird sounds. They got a plumber in there to look at it because then the shower started emitting this like black goo tar stuff. I'm like, what the heck is going on? The plumber was the first one. It was like, I think you have a poltergeist. <laughs> it's like, it was pretty bad when your plumber's like, hey, you know, I want to consider this. So uh, that was interesting. I was like, oh my God. This is really sad too because all their animals started dying. She was like a cat lady, you know, and bless her soul. She would just like adopt all these cats. Not hoarding, but getting there and like, you need to calm down, Jan. Um, but she loved animals, which is sweet. Um, but all the cats started getting super sick and they would watch things. And if you ever see animals and their spirit stuff going on, they know. Like they can see they have different rods and cones than us. Um, so her cats were kind of aware of what was going on. So anyways, it was interesting. This is another case where the entity uh, visited me. Let me know for a short on time. Um, but I'm sitting at the computer writing emails because every day I get emails about demons and ghosts from around the world and I'm responding to it. So sometimes I'm on edge because there's like a really messed up case I'm responding to and I'm sitting there. It's October and uh, we have a tornado siren in town, but it's like, you know, miles away. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden this horrendous shriek siren sound starts happening. It starts low and it goes all the way up high and then like a screech. And first nanosecond, I'm like, oh, it's a tornado siren. And then as soon as I like heard the whole thing, my hair stood up. Like it was the most unnatural sound I've ever heard. And the weird thing was, it came from like the center of the house, and yet everywhere. It was the weirdest. And I've heard other people, re re you know, report the same type of experience. It's everywhere, and yet it's nowhere. Like I don't know how to explain. It. Nothing in my house makes that sound. I tore out everything. The smoke detectors, like any sort of alarms. Like there's no way anything in my house made that sound. So anyway, so we're doing the blessing for the client later on, and. Um, Right before we're done with the blessing, I pulled you on the side and I was like, I heard this really weird sound in my house. And she's like, well, what did it sound like? And I mimicked it. I'm not going to do it because I'm going to sound ridiculous, but I tried to do it. So, um, but anyways, and she's like, oh my God, she got the biggest chill suit. She's like, that is exactly what I've been hearing in my house and throughout the heating vents and everything. And it's just another way where they show you that they can teleport. No matter if you run or leave or move away, they 90% of the time are going to follow you. They have these abilities with a thought can be somewhere else. 
Um, demonic entities can also be simultaneous places, like they are interdimensional beings, I think. I don't know how they do it, um, but it's just a way for them to show off, like, look what I can do. And, um, yeah, it's an intimidation tactic. So anyway, so we blessed her house, everything was fine. Um, the rest of the cats were healthy and happy, so that was a really good thing. Um, well, let's see, I'm skipping over all the cool stuff. This is at the Holly Hotel, which is down in Holly, Michigan by Fenton. There's definitely some dark entity in that basement cellar area. This actually isn't someone's shadow. Um, we took two pictures before and after. The one girl moved, but the way the, the light is uh, directed at that, it's definitely not a shadow. Um, and it's really dense compared to everyone else's shadow. So this is a before and after. Um, so yeah, it was kind of interesting. This one I'm skeptical of. One of the guys that works there was like, I caught this in the women's bathroom. I was like, one, what are you doing in the women's bathroom? <laughs> Two, like this looks like a cartoon. So I was like, I don't know. But this is supposedly a very legitimate uh, picture from, I think it's like, uh, yeah, Newberry Church Specter or whatever. And sometimes those are really demonic entities and they look gross like that. And they can kind of manifest how you would appear or think of them. It's kind of like Stephen King's It. Like they know what you're afraid of sometimes and can be shapeshifters, which is what the Native Americans refer to them as, like skinwalkers, uh, because they can shapeshift and alter themselves and um, really try to get at your inner psyche. If you guys want to learn more about demonology, I do. Uh, I created a course, um, not because I'm like, oh, I make money off this. I actually don't charge for any of my services. I do it for free. So a lot of people think you're out of your damn mind. So, um, especially when you put your life on the line, you know. Uh, but I just ask for donations to cover my gas and supplies and stuff because I'm just paying to help people and it gets expensive. Um, this is only 49 bucks. I think I get like $30 out of that. But most classes are like 200, 300 bucks on up. So if you want to, it's on my website, michiganperiod.com. I do have an exciting event very similar to this. It's at the parlor in Traverse City. It's 25 bucks. I figured I'd sweeten the deal by offering everybody one free beer or glass of wine uh, for whoever shows up. So, so if you want to do that, check it out. It's for sale on myingnorthtickets.com. If you guys are in the area, you're probably going to hear it on the um, radio station on Z93 and WTCM, I think. And we're going to be doing an interview and tarot readings with Jack O'Malley on the uh, country station, I think, next week and the week after that. Anyways, uh, I think we have a couple of time or minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Or? Don't be embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So are three scratch marks iconic of like demonic cases? Typically, yes, especially 3 a.m., uh, three scratch marks, the number three, because it's it's a mockery of the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, and so it's interesting, 3 p.m. was supposed to be the hour that Christ was crucif or crucified, and 3 a.m. is the mockery of that. But we'll have things that happen at 3 a.m., 3.30, 3.33, you know, whatever. It's, it, but they seem to be active during that time. And so a lot of times people will see three scratches, stuff like that. I do think human spirits are capable of harming people, like slapping and stuff. I just don't see scratches and uh, severe injuries as much in human spirit cases. So yeah, it's one of the characteristics I look for in demonic cases. I'm like, is there anything in correlation with sacrilegious stuff? Like three is the mockery of the divine trinity, you know, yada, yada. So very good question. Anybody else? Yes. Do you ever, do you ever take people with you like on? Yeah, I anything? have before. My boyfriend went with me to the Alpina case and um, it, I just get really nervous because, number one, I've had my whole family destroyed in some way. Like, I had stuff get ripped apart and, like, pseudo-divorce stuff related to these cases and bad things. And it, there's a sense of guilt. I mean, granted, people are responsible for the choices they made. Like, for example, my dad went down like, a very, very dark path, and that's his responsibility. But I often wonder if my work involved in this has led to that, you know, with demonic stuff because he's got some weird attachment to him. Um, but sometimes I'll take people there, but I worry about security and precautions. I want everyone to be safe because like I would feel so horrible if you were like, hey, I went with you, I'm like, now I got a demon in my house, you know? So that's why it's important to be very protected, yeah. um, do what's comfortable, what rings true to your soul, but make sure that you protect yourself and you practice that um, and don't let your guard down, especially if sometimes people, like not saying you, but say some random guys like, I wanna go, I don't know if he has a substance abuse issue or you know has some sort of dysfunction and he's vulnerable and he's like a perfect target, you know? Um, so it's kind of a risk. So I just try to work with one partner um, and then the whole family. I get them working as a team. I counsel with them and then I make them participate in the blessing. So like I can hold their hand, but really it's their fight. It's their battle. Um, the entities try to claim them, you know, not me. So I'm just there to kind of guide them. So good question. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Do you so Ouija or tarot card? Right. Do you believe that that opens a portal? 
you know, I'm not one to demonize stuff. Like, I get tarot readings. Some people are like, that's satanic. It's interesting if you actually look at the tarot deck. Like, there's a devil card, and that's not good. It's not a good card. So, And there's stuff about God and archangels and stuff in the tarot, and I use it to help people. Um, I think psychic and mediums can help heal people. I don't think spiritual communication is an evil tool. It even talks about it in Corinthians. So if somebody gets religious and is, you know, trying to drive home scripture, like, remind them of that. You know, um, so Corinthians, it talks about gifts of spirit, gifts of prophecy, gifts of tongue, uh, discernment, uh, things like that. So I think it's okay with pride, uh, you know, spiritual communication and using those tools. But I'm a huge advocate for you have to protect yourself. And oftentimes people using the Ouija board, I've, I've had cases start this way. It'll be like high schoolers, and they're drunk, and like smoking weed, and they're like, let's use a Ouija board, and then they don't say any of the protective prayer beforehand, and then they like summon stuff. I kind of compare the Ouija board to being a telemarketer, like you're the telemarketer, and you're dialing all these numbers, and you don't know who's going to pick up, and there's this demon being like, 1-800-DEMONS, like it's me, and I'm here, and, and then you welcome it in. So they, they claim legal rights, and by opening spiritually yourself or communicating with tools, that is a legal right of theirs, but they were conjuring, they were meddling. Um, but if you set prerequisites and like a spiritual barrier, like may only think of the divine light come through, nothing of darkness or evil, and I've seen that work for people. But why not just be safe and sorry, and like just don't do it, you know? But tarot's so different in a way, in my opinion, but I'm biased. Um, but Ouija board and spirit boards and pendulums and stuff, you have to be careful with any spiritual tool. Um, so good question. That answered that or no? Yes. Okay, good. Yep. How do you take care of yourself? How do I take care of myself? I don't know. I'm a wreck. Look at me. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm like, you guys, it's ruined my life. Um, I take time off. I'll go on a vacation or something like that to like decompress, you know? And it's hard not to take these things home. Like, it, you read in some of the cases in my book, I mean, there's some graphic stuff that have happened to these people, like trauma and abuse, like sexual abuse with knives, like messed up stuff. How do you not take that home, you know? So that's a really good question. I try to um, live a very balanced life. Um, I like to focus on happiness. I choose to be happy. Um, happiness is a practice. It really is. And it comes from within. It doesn't happen because of external things. It's something you originate from yourself. Um, so I practice that deeply. Um, but spiritually, I try to protect myself. I mean, I say prayers. I think I'm so heavily protected. Like I, like, I am so lucky. I've never been attacked. I've never had an attachment or anything like that. Like, I just think there's, like, an awesome, like, spiritual army that's like, we got your back. And I'm like, thank you. So, uh, so I just pray and hope that they are there and that they keep me protected. Um, but it's always a what if. There's always that risk, you know. But I'm doing something out of love, and I do like to think I get rewarded in a way where I'll be protected at least. So, yeah. And one more question. Um, do you um, do anything else but this? Like, do you have a... Like a job. I have like a normal life. Like, no, yeah, right now. This is like my double life. All my friends are like, I don't want to hear about it. Stop. And I'm like, all right. So um, and it was funny. I was texting Courtney. She's watching my dogs after the exorcism. She's like, how did it go? And I was like, well, I resorted to an exorcism, LOL. And she's like, you're the only person that would put like LOL after the question with you. But um, no, I have a normal life. I run a multimedia production company. Um, I primarily do wedding videography and photography. Um, so it's kind of funny because I think people have recognized her from TV shows and they're like, she's filming your wedding. Like, get that one out of here. Like, it's a weirdo. Um, so I do that. I do photography, marketing videos, stuff like that too. But this is something I do on the side. I used to do it every weekend, but then it like dissolves your entire life and it's exhausting. And yeah, so I just had to space it out. So now I could honestly probably handle like once a month because the amount of cases suck. I can't sleep the whole time up until house blessing. I start having weird crap going on at my house. And I might start fighting with my significant other, and there's this energy that's just building up, and then after the house blessing, it's gone, which is great. But it affects you. It definitely does. So um, so I try not to do it too much. But yeah, so this is something I do on the side nowadays. I don't get paid for it. It's not a career. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to be a demonologist. I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. So it's horrible. Um, so yeah, is that anybody else? And I'll be on the Sure, go ahead. Oh, we got both of you. Go ahead first. You know, in a, um, we have two. We have two cemeteries, the okay. Catholic one and the Evergreen Cemetery, yep. and the Protestant one. Which one did you? Oh, I don't know which one she went to, because she went, to, her husband was killed in a car accident, and was hit by a drunk driver, I honestly don't know which one she went to, I think it was probably the Protestant one, because I don't think she was Catholic. I don't think so. Um, so yeah, so she spent like every day there for hours, and that's not healthy. Because I spend a lot of time with the Catholic ones. Right, well, well you're probably safe, so don't worry about it. I mean, I think, I think really what it was was like, there's a communication tool. Like, I'm not going there. 
Right, yeah. No, I think it was going back to the tarot, you know, Ouija board. She was so open, just begging for anything. Please, I want to get a hold of my husband. And this thing's like, I'm your husband. I, I can be your husband. You know, and it just took advantage of that opportunity. Real quick, I think they're kicking out. Do you use the term host lesson? Is yeah. that something different you know, it's interesting because people can use the term exorcism. Most people think of an exorcism as when somebody's possessed or casting a demon out of them physically. Um, there's technically like exercise in the house. I mean, that's what we're doing when we do a house blessing. But um, deliverance and exorcism are kind of when the person's possessed, at least how I refer to it as, or those two things. And a house blessing or house cleansing um, is basically you're removing the, de the demon from a house, basically, or that energy from those people's lives. You're removing those attachments that it's made to these people. Um, so yes, it's with the house, but it's also with the people, too. You're cutting any cords or ties that it has to them and, and removing it from the house so they can't come back. So does that answer that a little bit better? Or Okay, good. Anybody else? I think, uh, John, maybe you should I get off? Yeah. Get out of here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, anytime I should shut up. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, anybody else? Last quick question. Anybody else? You in the back. I mean, I know you quick, but like the difference between like negative and you know, like a Yeah. And you yeah, there's characteristics I could show you too on there, and it's in the book too. I try to explain it, but basically, demonic entities have more powers and abilities than human spirits. They can throw furniture or whatever, whereas a human spirit might like move an object. You know, or like open a door, you know, or demons are like, boom, here's a couch, and it just rockets across the room. Like, oh my god, yeah, I'm like, look at this. Um, so, yeah, so there's definitely a different energy level and intensity and abilities. There's also prophetic, telepathic type stuff, and there's very signature, like sacrilegious, blasphemous things that they do. They hate religion, they hate God, they hate love. Um, light, anything that's good. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'll definitely go over with that too, but there's dark human spirits too. I mean, negative, you, you could meet a really cranky, nasty person walking down the sidewalk, and it's the same way after they pass away. They're still going to be nasty and cranky, unless they, you know, if they haven't crossed over, they're earthbound and still cranky and nasty. So there's a lot of human spirits that are dark and nasty, and sometimes I've seen cases where there's a demonic entity and a dark human spirit, and they're like working in conjunction. Um, so it's, it's definitely interesting. So yeah, there's just negative side of the spectrum in between gray shades and then into good stuff too. So. Um, so I should shut up and get in the back. I need to get in here. So thank you guys so much for your time. Oh, wait, actually, yes, that's it. Okay, thank you.